Hi, I'm Bob Deeks. I am a builder and renovator out of Whistler, British Columbia. We work uh, the Sea to Sky Corridor from Vancouver all the way north to Pemberton. Uh, and in this masterclass, I'm going to share, you know, some of my advice, some of my experiences, the good, the bad and the ugly uh, on how I developed my home building and renovation business and some advice to you on how I think that you could either develop your business or some opportunities for you in terms of getting into the business. And what are the, some of the things that I would strongly recommend that you consider uh, as you move into the new home and renovation business, whether it's in British Columbia, whether it's in Canada, or anywhere else around the world, because it's all the same. Some of the things that I'll talk about uh, will be, how do you build high performance? What are some of the things that you consider uh, when you're getting into that high performance space? And some of the things that you need to know to understand where the building code is going and how you're gonna meet those new expectations. Hi, I'm Bob Deeks. Uh, I am the president of RDC Fine Homes. We're located out of Whistler, British Columbia. You might remember Whistler from the 2010 Olympics, uh, where all the Alpine venues were. Uh, I uh, always had a passion for skiing. Uh, I grew up ski racing, and uh, when I graduated from university, uh, I really thought that the one thing on my bucket list at that time was to spend a winter at a mountain ski resort, and uh, ended up in Whistler in 1983. Uh, for a winter of skiing uh, and uh, worked in the ski school. In those days, uh, Whistler was not nearly as busy, of course, as it is today, and there was very little work. And so after spending uh, the winter in Whistler as a starving ski instructor, swore I had put that behind me and I would never come back. Uh, fast forward uh, five years and uh, I was actually between jobs and a really good friend of mine was back in Whistler and said, hey, you should come on out. Uh, there is great skiing and uh, they need help within the ski school. So I came out for two months, uh, got a cushy job teaching skiing. Uh, I had a background in ski racing, so ended up helping out with uh, the Whistler Mountain Ski Club. And uh, one morning, uh, after far too many drinks, um, uh, went out with a friend and ended up buying two vacant lots on Alta Lake. And all of a sudden, there was a, a career shift in front of me. Uh, I had bought two lots, and we had decided we were going to come out and build a spec house. So you might wonder how you know what was my background. Uh, I had a commerce degree and was working in advertising, so I had uh, very very little background on construction other than helping my father uh, renovate his cottage uh, as a younger person. And I had renovated a house in Toronto uh, and uh, just was in the position where we had sold that renovated house and had some money. And so uh, overnight uh, was now a property owner and decided to be a developer. So changed my career course, uh, didn't go back to advertising, came out in the fall of 1988 with the plan to build a house, uh, sell it, and um, spend a little bit of time in Whistler. So uh, moving forward to the spring of 1989, uh, the bank was uh, astute enough to recognize that we had uh, no background in building houses and we were much too high a risk and declined our uh, construction draw mortgage application. And so there I was in Whistler with two vacant lots that I really couldn't afford to keep because of course I couldn't sleep on them. Uh, and so the market conditions had shifted. Uh, we turned out, uh, we sold the two lots, made some money. Uh, I had started uh, coaching ski racing in the winter for the Whistler Mountain Ski Club and without really giving it too much thought, took the proceeds from the sale of the lots and bought a house. And so in 12 months, uh, I went from working in advertising in Toronto with a commerce degree to moving to Whistler and becoming a homeowner and really didn't know what to do with myself beyond coaching ski racing in the winter. Uh, the only skill set that I really had that I thought was saleable in the community was a carpenter. So I uh, got myself a job as a carpenter without really any background uh, in carpentry um, and spent the, uh, the next year um, between April and November uh, doing concrete forming. So I got a really good education in concrete forming. And then over the next couple of years, had the opportunity to work for an exceptional build builder um, and uh, really de de developed a passion for building custom homes. 
And so uh, came out in 1997 for a couple of months and have lived in Whistler ever since. Uh, you know, our journey to becoming a high performance builder, uh, specializing in doing net zero new homes and, and renovations really started in the late 90s uh, when I had an opportunity to actually go and build a spec house. And uh, the house on the property had been significantly renovated five years before. Now they hadn't done a great job uh, on the renovation, but the home had a lot of usable materials and I just could not see myself taking that house and dumping it into the landfill. So uh, I posted um, an ad, a classified ad in the local paper, uh, which was essentially house for free, as long as you come and remove it from the property. And I had a guy who showed up uh, gung-ho, he brought a team of 20 people for a long weekend and they hand demolished the house, they took all the materials, took all the nails out, they packaged it all up and I, I believe he went up north in Pemberton and he, and he used all those materials to reassemble a new house. And so that was really my first foray into you know, sustainable building practices and over the next couple of years really became interested in you know, what could we do better uh, both from an energy perspective, from an indoor air quality perspective. So we got involved in installing heat recovery ventilators in uh, the late 90s, which I think at this point was very, very early on um, in the development of, uh, of, of ventilation standards. We tripped over uh, David Hill's uh, company, EnerReady. So we became uh, a big fan of the EnerReader, EnerReady, <laughs> EnerReady HRVs. Um, and slowly started to begin to understand, you know, what it was that we had to do to build a better house. In 2003, um, a colleague of mine who was uh, a prominent builder in Whistler phoned me up and said, we are going to start a chapter of the Canadian Home Builders Association in Whistler. Would you like to join? I, I knew nothing about the home builders, but really recognized that we were building in a bubble. It was a very small community and we were very isolated. And I think at that point I was really desperate to try and figure out how to do things better. And I saw joining the home builders as a way to get a better education um, and to connect with a broader, the broader community of builders to learn from them. And um, once we joined the home builders, we really never looked back. Uh, it opened up a, an enormous door uh, of opportunity and education. Um, the courses that CHBA BC put on, we very quickly engaged with those. I got my staff to do them. And by 2006, we had engaged with the uh, Built Green program and we finished our first Built Green home. Uh, we got uh, Built Green Gold, which was the highest standard at the time. And that really was our stepping stone uh, to net zero construction. 2008, the uh, Equilibrium program sponsored by CMHC federally was being uh, launched and I sat through a number of presentations on building a net zero. That's what equilibrium was. It was, uh, it was a gateway to try and figure out how to do net zero houses. And I made the decision at that point that we were going to be the first builder in BC to complete a net zero house. Uh, we, we made an application through the equilibrium program. Uh, we weren't selected, but I had designed a house. I had a client uh, and so we forged ahead and we uh, as a consequence of not having to engage in the program, we're able to get in the ground a little bit earlier. And so uh, I think we really did finish, you know, one of the first houses that had an EnerGuide label that established that we had built a house that produced as much energy as it used through the HOT 2000 model. Uh, it had solar panels on it and we used it as a demonstration project for the 2010 Olympics. The uh, owners um, moved in, uh, after the Olympics were over and uh, we, yeah, we had uh, a thousand people or so, I think through a number of open houses to demonstrate in those days, which was, which was, you know, very, very new concept, which was, you know, this idea of a net zero um, ready house. Uh, and so, you know, that created a stepping stone. Uh, I was part of the group that uh, developed the net zero standard for uh, CHBA nationally, which is now the net zero label. Uh, that builders across the country who are members uh, can engage with in a great way to get up to speed on building high performance houses. Of course, of course, now we have uh, a, a new federal code that's coming out uh, that uh, will require net zero construction by you know 2030. 
Uh, and in, in BC, uh, we have had the BC Energy Step Code since 2017, which has been a, a voluntary uh, energy code that municipalities could adopt. And so the net zero education that we had has been uh, a, a great way for us to get up to speed on how to meet the new code requirements. Um, and uh, it's been very exciting to uh, also be part of that code development sitting on the Standing Committee for Energy Efficiency with Codes Canada through the development uh, of the national standard and uh, also participating on the BC Energy Step Code development. Um, and as I, uh, I, I still uh, am involved with that as the, uh, the co-vice chair of the um, BC Energy Step Code Council. I've been now in the industry for 30 years. Uh, I started my company in 1993, so we're heading towards our 30th anniversary. I'm really excited about uh, the changes that are happening in the industry, the opportunities that are out there for us to continue to build better houses. You know, our, one of our taglines is uh, healthy homes for happy families uh, and building a better house. Technology has really transformed you know, what we build and how we build. 10 years ago, most houses were built to the same standard that they had been built for 40 years. With the advent of technology and the BC Energy Step Code, that is shifting very, very rapidly. And so while a lot of people look at the Energy Step Code as being a focus on energy efficiency, we figured out a long time ago that the things that made a house energy efficient were the things that also built a better house. The Thermal performance values, you know, the insulation in the walls and the ceiling and the foundation, the strategies to make it airtight, that created a house that had very even temperature distribution. It was thermally much more comfortable. Airtight houses enable you to control your own ventilation, uh, so dramatically improves the indoor air quality within the house. They're more durable, so uh, you know this is this has sort of been our journey is is figuring out you know how do we leverage the changes that are coming to continually look at how we build a better house for our clients. And a big part of that, uh, of course, is as housing becomes more and more expensive, is how do we do this in the most cost-effective way we can? We're a luxury home builder. I think sometimes people view luxury home building as having clients who are not all that concerned with cost. I can tell you from 30 years of personal experience, uh, our luxury clients are just as concerned with cost as everybody else. And so we're always under pressure to try and find better ways to do things that deliver on value for our clients. Uh, and then of course, you know, technology is opening up all these new opportunities from uh, home integration, where you have a single keypad that will operate your in-house audio. It'll operate all your televisions. Um, it'll control the temperature in individual rooms in the house. It'll operate your blinds. And so that's creating you know, very exciting opportunities for my staff and our clients to explore, you know, what are the opportunities that people have as they design and build their new houses. Uh, my involvement both with the home builders and the code development process uh, has been very, very engaging. Um, you know, one of the things that for anybody who's getting into, this, into, the, into the industry, uh, I, I can't recommend strongly enough is get involved with your local home building association you know, volunteer some time and get on a committee. You know, that's where the best learning outcomes are. That's where you're going to meet the, your, your most exciting peer group. You're going to have an opportunity to share uh, with people who are aggressive and trying to figure out how to do things better. And so, you know, as I'm getting older uh, and we're developing a company that uh, has more opportunity to stand on its own feet, it, it doesn't need me uh, project managing. Uh, it doesn't need me day to day trying to make sure that we hit payroll. And so it absolutely has freed some time up to uh, contribute to the industry, uh, particularly with Codes Canada, to help develop the codes for tomorrow. Um, and those are codes that are, are, are practical for the building industry, um, that bring uh, a level of affordability to them and are safe uh, so that we develop new strategies for high performance buildings that ensure those buildings are going to be durable uh, for the warranties that uh, the builders have to adhere to and for the clients that are going to move into them. 
Um, and I think the other thing that I found really exciting over the last 10 years is developing a better business. Um, and at some point, you know, I'm going to need to transition. Um, I, I, can't, I can't be a builder forever. And, you know, I've got this business that now has a mind of its own. You know, we have warranty uh, that extends back many, many years for clients. Uh, we have responsibilities. And, you know, trying to set up a business that after I choose to go and do something else is sustainable uh, and benefits the clients that we had in the past, the clients that we have today, and the clients that we're going to have tomorrow. And, you know, even more importantly, benefits the staff who have put so much effort into building a great organization. And so I think that that's my second passion now um, is developing a system within RDC Fine Homes that continues to deliver on our core values every day, uh, not only for our clients, um, but also for our trades and most importantly for our staff. And so they've got this career opportunity in front of them for as long as they want to be part of RDC, they know that they've got a place to work that is going to continue to deliver a paycheck to support them and their family uh, for as long as, as, as they want. Uh, you know, what is, what do we specialize in? You know, what's our secret sauce? Uh, when we started, absolutely, we were the leaders, I know, we were the leaders in delivering that uh, better built, thermally comfortable, uh, high indoor air quality, energy efficient house. We knew how to do it. You know, that, um, that niche in our market has very, very quickly been pulled out from underneath us. Uh, the BC Energy Step Code requiring people to build a step three across the province in December. Um, you know, that's, that's the standard that we viewed as being a really high performance house in the mid 2000s. Um, so, you know, whether you like it or not, as a builder, you are becoming a high performance builder. Um, and so, you know, for us, we, we recognized a few years ago that, you know, we were going to have to shift gears. You know, what did we want to be recognized for? I always knew that, you know, customer service was important. It took me way too long to, as I noted earlier, you know, it took me way too long to figure out, you know, what was, what were the things that really made our clients happy? What were the things that really annoyed them? Um, and I, you know, what I've come back to is, uh, you know, we, we're, we're working very, very hard on a system that creates predictability. Uh, it creates predictable outcomes in terms of quality. It creates predictable outcomes in terms of cost. And it creates predictable outcomes in terms of schedule. Uh, and we want, you know, our clients to wake up every morning while they're in construction with a smile on their face. Uh, and then when we move them into that house, we want to make sure that they wake up every morning or as many mornings as possible um, with a smile on their face because they love their house. And so the secret sauce is, is working with your team to develop a system that day in, day out creates those predictable outcomes in exactly the same way. You know, we've grown, we have, I think, six project managers. Um, we're still struggling to make sure that everybody does things in exactly the same way every day. Um, you know, it's not only uh, the project management teams, but it's also what that gets done on site. And so that, I think that's going to be an ongoing journey for us and something that really excites me is working with my team to continually develop those systems that make sure that we deliver the same result day in, day out. Doesn't matter uh, which house is getting built, it's getting built to the same standard with the same system that creates those per same predictable outcomes for our clients. You know, as I noted earlier, until very recently, the industry in Canada was building houses in the same way that, you know, we built them 40 years ago. Um, which was not a bad thing. I mean, Canadians are renowned worldwide for building great houses. You know, we had, you know, reasonably good uh, insulation values or thermal performance values. But we are in a new age where we are now being dictated to by government through codes on the energy performance of what we build. In the province of British Columbia, this is now a performance-based standard where you have to use the services of an energy modeler, you have to use an energy model. And so it is creating an accountability in what we build that never existed before. You know, previously, uh, and until very, very recently, there were prescriptive things that you had to do. There was a visual verification from your building code official that you had basically done those things, but nobody really sat on top of you and tested, you know, what you were building. And so today, as we move to performance-based codes, which is what we have in British Columbia. We now have to recognize that what we build is going to be tested. And of course, in British Columbia, we have a 
relatively stringent warranty process um, where that also creates some accountability. And I think, you know, what's really exciting for people and the opportunity that is there is is really, you know, learn, you know, how do you how do you do this in a cost effective way? How do you engage with your team to make sure that you're taking advantage of the new products and technologies that are out there? Uh, I know change can be difficult, um, and particularly for builders who have been building the same way for a long time. There's a real comfort zone there, and you know, as you step out of it, it creates more risk. So, you know, my best advice is really find great partners um, to help you on this journey because you, you really don't have any choice. While British Columbia is going to, you know, move province-wide to step three of the BC Energy Step Code for houses, uh, the rest of the country is going to very quickly follow suit as the National Energy Code for Part 9 buildings and houses comes into force. Every province in the country is at some point going to have a mandatory energy requirement within the building code that is different than what you're used to today. Uh, so when we talk about partnering with your trade professionals, you know, find uh, an energy advisor that you can trust, somebody who has uh, experience uh, and can guide you along this pathway to cost-effective, high-performance houses. You know, look for designers who have experience uh, in building high-performance houses and, and renovating high-performance houses. Uh, this is a very difficult journey on your own. And then I loop back to the resources that exist within your local home building association. There is no better place to figure this out than engaging with your peer group through CHBA. Uh, I guarantee you that the members who are there, they are willing to share. They'll, they'll share the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, the one thing uh, that I really hope for builders who are coming into the industry today is that you don't have to learn the same way that we did. And you know, I have lots of colleagues uh, who build high performance um, in the province of British Columbia particularly, and we all learn through the school of hard knocks. It cost us a lot of money. Um, and I think we've led the way to some degree to demonstrate you know, the, the, the strategies that you can use that are cost effective and safe. Um, but the only way that you're going to uh, find that information is to engage with your peer group. Do not be afraid to share your experience with others. I know that um, the best builders in the industry are always welcome to share with you. And in fact, you know, I get calls relatively frequently from people asking for advice on, you know, how did we do this? You know, how, where are we going? What do we recommend? You know, I'm always available uh, if somebody has a question on an, uh, a product or a technology that they're looking to use. We are an industry that is very good at sharing. And so use that resource through your local home builders chapter um, to your benefit and your team's benefit. So you're not, you, you're, not, you're not learning those expensive lessons that a lot of us have had to, uh, have had to learn. When uh, the, the 2000s hit and uh, there was obviously some opportunity with regard to high performance in houses, one of my, you know, one of my motivations absolutely is we were a new company. We were trying to find our place in the market. And I quickly recognized that there were very few people in our industry who were really positioning themselves as green energy efficient home builders. And so I decided at that time that uh, that was the place for us. You know, we could hammer out a unique place in the market by marketing ourselves as energy efficient green home builders. And so then, you know, we started to look for different uh, ways to uh, enable us to stand apart. And so, as I noted earlier, we did the uh, first, our first built green Canada build in 2006. And then I was looking for the next, you know, the next thing. And uh, I went to a presentation on rammed earth. And you might say, well, what is rammed earth? Well, rammed earth is uh, a system of building using um, what they call as a mass wall. So you're using sand and gravel in the province of British Columbia with our seismic and snow loads. We had to add some Portland cement to it. And uh, you tamp that material down inside a form, much like a concrete form, and you build these, these, these mass walls that are essentially made out of compacted sand and gravel and a little bit of concrete. And you might say, well, you know, why would you ever build a house out of just basic sand and gravel? A little bit of concrete, you know, wouldn't it fall down? Well, interestingly, you know, rammed earth has been around for uh, more than a millennia. There are parts of the Great Wall of China uh, that are rammed earth. There are 
existing structures in China that uh, are well over 2,000 years old um, that are built out of rammed earth. You know, it has been proven as a technology that stands the test of time. And so I, I went to this presentation and they showed me buildings built in France after the French Revolution uh, that were rammed earth. Uh, there were buildings, actually, there was a renaissance of rammed earth in the southern United States after the Civil War. Rammed earth was very popular in areas where uh, there was a lot of uh, economic hardship. And so in certain areas where the right sand and gravel existed and some clay, people could actually build their own houses. And so they were um, you know, very, very comfortable houses to live in. You know, the, the, the thickness of the walls you know, generally kept the houses reasonably comfortable in winter and then they were cool in summer. And so uh, I, I went through a presentation and I thought, that's it, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna become rammed earth builders because that's the next great green thing. And so uh, I sent two guys off to rammed earth school, spent way too much money um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and designed and we built a rammed earth spec house. It turned out to be not that green. Uh, the footings that we had to use to support the weight of the walls were five feet wide and 12 inches thick. So, you know, all the concrete that we were saving uh, in a typical foundation actually ended up going in the footings. Um, the house was beautiful. Uh, it was a cost a fortune to build. It was incredibly labor intensive. Of course, none of that was really explained to us when we went to school, learn how to do this. Um, and, you know, in the end, we, we built a beautiful house and I lost my shirt. Uh, somebody, you know, we, we had a client who, who bought the house, Eric Carlson of Anthem Properties bought the house. Uh, and to this day, uh, you know, he, every time I, I see him, he's like, this is the best house I've ever had. Um, you know, he shared with me, he said, I, I've built every house uh, that my family has lived in. And in the end, you built me the best house I lived in. Um, so, you know, good experience on that side, uh, but really in the end, it was not a really green, sustainable strategy for building houses in Whistler. It was incredibly expensive um, and was absolutely uh, the wrong way uh, to enter into the development industry. Um, we also were introduced uh, to some advanced technology, advanced, you know, we thought was advanced on, you know, hyper efficient uh, heating and cooling systems. And so I got really caught up in the, the excitement of, of this new technology. I didn't really grasp how complicated it was when we started. I, I, I jumped in with both feet. We committed three projects to this heating and ventilation system uh, that was not proven. Uh, it, was, it turned out to be incredibly expensive to install and it didn't work. So one of the, you know, the key lessons for me in the last 30 years is keep it simple. Uh, there, there are a lot of shiny things out there. there. There's a ton of new technology bombarding us every day. Take it, take it a small piece at a time. And, and really look for technology that is simple. Uh, if it's too complicated, your trades won't understand it, your staff doesn't understand it, your design professionals don't understand it, and it is gonna haunt you for years. And yeah, that, that foray into that heating system haunted me for a good six years. Um, and I spent money uh, replacing it, fixing it, modifying it. That was, you know, that was one of the most painful lessons for me uh, on that, but you know, it was, a, it was a very, very good lesson and keep it simple. And so, you know, it, it, it extends to, you know, whether you're building envelope, you know, you're building envelope, you're, you're framing systems, the insulation you use, the, the sticky products you can put on the outside of your house to benefit air tightness. They all have a very steep learning curve and be very careful in terms of what, what you engage with. Um, and I can't repeat this enough, is uh, simple stuff works best. You know, one, you know, one of the things that I think is the most frustrating, the most difficult part of building a house is, you know, as the owner of the company, in the end, I have very little control uh, directly over what goes on every day. Um, you know, that they come back to, you know, the system that you have within your company uh, to ensure those consistent results. And that's something that you have influence on. You hire your staff, your staff are accountable to you, they're accountable to your system. And so you have, you know, you have a lot of influence over your team. You cannot build, you cannot successfully build a great house without a great team of subtrades. Uh, your subtrades don't work for you. Um, and so your accountability levers are fewer. So how do you find the best trades and how do you make sure they understand your system and they deliver uh, on the type of build that you have sold to your client? You know, how do, how do you find the trade uh, that delivers on that high performance promise? 
So some of these things you can do internally. You know, as a general contractor, we have our own carpenters. So we typically do our own foundations. We do our own framing. So, you know, we can manage that thermal comfort because we do it internally. But we can't, we can't manage the electrical side. We, you know, we, we don't do the plumbing. We don't do the mechanical side. And I think one of the most challenging parts of the shifting sands of housing technology has absolutely been heating and ventilation systems. Very, very important that you look for a mechanical contractor who understands the needs of a high performance house. He knows how to do a calculation to determine the heat loss and heat gain for the different rooms in their house and they can apply that to modern technology to deliver on that promise of thermal comfort. I think your, your mechanical contractor, the guy who's going to install that furnace or that heat pump or that hydronic floor, uh, they are one of your, your most important clients. And if there isn't somebody in your, ra in, in your neighborhood or in your region who's up to speed on that, then you know, I take the responsibility, find somebody who's interested in learning and take them under your wing and help them become educated. There is a ton of uh, education opportunities out there. Uh, if they need help, show them the way, uh, because in the end, that's only gonna benefit you. Uh, we have had you know, this experience like everybody else. You have a client with a budget, you're fighting to try and get the cost of the house down to the budget, and so you desperately look for that trade who's gonna come to the table with that low price that meets your budget expectation as you're, uh, you know, uh, as you're trying to get sign off on that budget with your client. And so you sort of, uh, you know, you hold your breath, you, you bring that guy on with the cheapest price because right now that's what your client wants. And then down the road, uh, the cheapest price does not deliver on the expectation of the high performance. And then who becomes responsible for the delivery of the high performance expectation? Well, it becomes you, the builder. And so one of the things that we definitely have learned the hard way, and I think we've unfortunately learned this lesson more than once, is uh, if you're truly going to deliver on a high performance house, that meets the client's expectations and hire the trades that are charging what they need so that they can educate their staff and that they're profitable. There is no point in hiring trades that are shaving their margin to the point where they can't deliver on what you need or are not building a profitable business. Uh, so you have to look for those trades that are engaged, that are keeping themselves educated, uh, that understand their business and are charging enough to make a buck. Um, align yourself with them, treat them well, communicate clearly to them, uh, and partner with them going forward. I think you know your trades and your staff are your greatest assets to delivering on the promise that you're making to your clients. Uh, they're equally important, and you need to treat them in the same way. So as I you know I noted you know I get calls every once in a while uh, from people who uh, are interested in building a better house or building a high performance house. Right now, if you have an experience of building homes in the way that we've been building homes for a long time. You know, typically you're building a two by six wall, you're putting an R20 or R22 fiberglass bat in it, you're putting six mil poly that's taped and sealed uh, to the inside of the wall assembly, uh, you're, and you're drywalling it and away you go. You know, that, that's, that's been our basic code for a long, long time. Uh, nobody blower door tested it, uh, so you really, you know, you did your best job visually that you could to tape and seal that air barrier up, air barrier and vapor barrier up, uh, and you're good to go. Today, as building codes move to higher and higher levels of energy efficiency, now we need to look for different wall systems. And there are there's thousands of different, so different ways that you can put a wall together to get a higher performing wall. Uh, so, you know, people call me, you know, fairly regularly to try and find out, you know, what is it that I'm doing you know, what are the products we're using? What are the strategies we're using to try and meet the energy model's expectation on, you know, is it an effective R26 wall or an R30 wall? So that's certainly something that I can share. My best advice on, you know, the way that you build your house and the materials and strategies that you use for um, the metrics that uh, you need for energy efficiency is work carefully with your energy advisor. They can help you with that sort of Rubik's cube or that puzzle of, you know, do I put all my insulation in the walls or do I put it in the ceiling or I put it in my slab? You know, they can give you some very, very good guidance through that integrated design process uh, on, on where you should start to put your investment. You can run the budgets um, based on, you know, one uh, type of material 
versus another. Going back to the, the, the keep it simple um, principle is use materials that are easy for your staff to install. Uh, use materials that they're, they're used to. There's a lot of stuff off the shelf that you can adapt, do things in a slightly different way um, that will deliver the results that you need to meet the, both the, you know, the, the energy model expectations and your client's expectations. Um, you know, foundations, we see a lot of people now transitioning to insulated concrete forms or ICF. So I get people calling me, um, you know, interested to know what's my experience with ICF. Is it a good material to use? Uh, and absolutely, you know, again, you know, find a brand that your staff uh, can easily understand how it goes together and then st stick with the same thing. So once you have a system, uh, stick with what you know, train your team on it and, you know, try to avoid uh, the sales pitch from the guy that is promising that if you just use this new building wrap or you just use this new tape or you just use this new ICF, somehow miraculously, you're gonna have a better house and it's gonna save you a lot of money. Look for new systems that you understand. Find somebody who can explain to you how to do it and then stick with it. I think a lot of us, you know, we get, we get into home building because we really love building houses. Um, what we were very naive on and what we didn't anticipate is when we built these great houses, we also got clients. It took us a long time to really figure out how to manage our clients properly. Um, you know, the, your, your client uh, is your most important asset, um, you know, besides your staff. And you really have to engage with them in a meaningful way, understand what their expectations are, communicate clearly to them. You know, this is all stuff that you'll get in books. Uh, and you can pick this up everywhere. Easy to read about, hard to um, apply. And as we headed into the arena of high performance, you know, initially in trying to engage clients and understand their expectations, we, like a lot of builders, thought, okay, green buildings on the horizon, there's gonna be people lined up who want green, sustainable, energy efficient housing. And so off we went trying to sell energy efficiency. And I figured out very quickly uh, to our benefit that when I talked energy efficiency, particularly when I got technical, people's eyes glazed over and I lost their attention. When I go back to my earlier comments about what does energy efficiency deliver in a better built house, we quickly figured out that what people were really interested in was an even, evenly heated and cooled house. They, you know, everybody's used to growing up in a house that was drafty and cold in the winter and was too hot in the summer. So we started to really focus on these are the things that we can do for you that will deliver that more comfortable house. And then indoor air quality. You know, doing whole home ventilation with heat recovery was a very, very easy sell when we started to focus on the air quality within your house. It was gonna smell fresher. Uh, it was gonna have fewer contaminants. It would be better for your family. And so as we started to understand that, we could sell on the benefits of a better built house that was also energy efficient. So in the early days, there were not a lot of people lined up for energy efficient houses but there were a lot of people who were lined up to buy a better house. And so we, we really started to understand, you know, the, 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 the speaking notes um, that we really needed to have to engage people and then really questioning them around what their expectations were. Because if I ask somebody, would you like a house that's more comfortable? 99% of the people are gonna say yes. Do you want a house that has better indoor air quality? That's another yes. So while they may not want a house that's energy efficient, they want those other things. And once you explain to them that the more comfortable house with the better indoor air quality comes as an energy efficient house, now it's not so difficult to sell energy efficiency. Of course, you know, the landscape has changed a lot in the last 20 years because energy efficiency is getting codified. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to sell your clients on those benefits that come along with energy efficiency. And what's really important is to make sure you understand your client's goals and expectations and then sell to those expectations. There's no better way to gain a client's trust than understanding what they want and then selling it back to them. We do a questionnaire uh, for all our new client intakes um, and that becomes our greatest sales tool because they're telling me what they want in a new house. So then I can sit down in front of them and I can parrot that back to them 
and say, yes, you know, we have uh, a strategy for better indoor air quality. Yes, we, we, we have a strategy on uh, distributed audio. Um, we can do a fully integrated house um, because I know that that's what want, they want. Um, you know, the one thing that I think has been, it's taken me a long time to understand is, you know, what are the levers that motivate your client? What are the things that upset them? You know, where do you lose your clients? Where, do you, where does conflict come from? Uh, you know, my, you know, the thing that I would be able to share, and I think this is something that we all feel is whenever we uh, become intimidated, uh, whenever we're scared, uh, whenever we become anxious, um, we have trouble managing our emotions. And so when people are involved in building a house, they're spending a lot of money. Uh, and while they will develop some trust with you as a builder, as they sign the contract, you know, it takes a long time to really solidify that trust. And until you really have the trust of your client in the back of their mind, they're going to be anxious and they might be afraid. And so when things, you know, when you have a misstep, uh, that can create a lot of conflict. And so it took us a long time to really understand that and develop some strategies to connect with our clients in a way that, you know, made sure that we understood their expectations and we were meeting them every week. Um, and then when we didn't meet their expectations, there was a communication loop that enabled them with confidence to tell us right away, hey, you know, I'm not very happy with this or I don't think we're doing the right thing here. The worst thing you can do is to allow your clients to feel that they're not empowered to put their hand up when they don't think, think things are going right and to let that go for months at a time. You know, bad news does not get better with age. And so if people are frustrated and you allow that to build up and there's no way for them to release that, that's when we really create a lot of conflict in our industry. And, you know, it's really unfortunate that when you ask people, you know, what are, the, what are some of the things that they least look forward to doing? You know, one of them is building a house. You know, I've, I've lost clients who, you know, we engaged in the early phase as they started to look at a new house and then they had uh, colleagues and friends who would tell them, you don't want to do that. You know, building a house is the worst experience you could possibly have. You know, nobody comes in on budget. They're always late. It costs too much money. You should just go buy an, uh, an existing house and, you know, do a simple renovation. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, that's a story that, you know, as home builders, you know, I'm passionate about trying to change that story because if you engage with the right builder who understands how to, how to learn the expectations of their client, has a good communication loop, um, and has a great team, then home building can be a great experience. And, you know, we have, we have lots of clients uh, over the years uh, who, who will tell you that, you know, building a house with us was a fantastic experience. And I know, you know, there's lots of fantastic builders in British Columbia who can line up and, uh, you know, show you clients who uh, also had a great experience. Uh, yeah, understand, understand your client's expectations have a good communication loop and address conflict as soon as it comes up. Building high performance does not have to be difficult and it does not have to be complicated. But when you design a house over here and then you try to bolt on the energy efficiency, indoor air quality and thermal comfort over here, it can get very expensive and very complicated. So, you may have heard the term, you know, an integrated design process, IDP. This is something that's become key to the development of all our projects. We tell our clients upfront uh, that if you're gonna work with us, uh, we need to work together from the very earliest stages of design. Um, and there are certain key partners that we need to bring in early on. We need to have our energy advisor at the table to enable us to understand if the design is going to be consistent with the energy thermal characteristics and the indoor air quality that we're looking for. It can be very, very difficult and expensive to bolt those things on after a design is completed. So, you know, that integrated process starts from day one. So, you know, we want to be at the table with our clients, uh, with their design professional in the earliest stages so we can help make sure that that process is going in the right direction. One of the the scariest things for people, as we noted, is the cost of housing. Housing is getting more expensive by the day. And if you don't create that integrated process, clients can start a, start a design process with an expectation of a budget of X. And by the time the design is finished and they're going to permit and they finally budget it, it can be 2X. 
that is not a happy day. It's not a happy day for the client. It's not a happy day for the architect. And it's definitely a bad day for the builder who thought they had a great project. And now the client is telling them, well, that house is twice as much as I can afford. And I'm going to cancel the project. And I've, I've seen that happen. And so, you know, our process is uh, we start, we get a concept design. As soon as we have a concept design, we have a system that will produce a budget right away. And so that creates an opportunity that before the client has designed, you know, spent too much time on design, hasn't spent a ton of money on it, they get a check. You know, is this consistent with our budget? And it gives them opportunities. So they can either change the design or they can increase the budget and they do it in an informed way. You know, my experience has been that if you give your client uh, a choice on spending more money or not spending money, if they have the money, they, they typically will spend the money. But if you don't give them a choice um, and you back them into a, a corner, uh, they're going to they're gonna switch horses. Um, they'll either go find somebody else who will make a promise of a cheaper build uh, or they'll shelve the project altogether. Uh, so that integrated process keeps them uh, as part of the team. It keeps them informed through the process so that when you get to those building permit plans, you can be confident that you have a design that your client is excited about and they have a budget that meets their cost expectations. And then you can move into construction as a team, uh, all on the same page with a high degree of probability that you're gonna have a successful project. So as, as builders, I think sometimes we can, we can become quite technical without understanding that we're being technical. And when we, you know, so what is high performance? I think as, as builders these days, that term gets thrown around a lot. And what does it really mean? You know, one of the things that I've always um, look to compare is houses to cars. And I always have recognized that the automobile industry has done a fantastic job on selling performance in automobiles that are fuel efficient. And of course, very rarely do you hear about car, do you hear car manufacturers necessarily promoting um, fuel efficiency on their cars, but they're very, very good at promoting the feeling of you sitting in that driver's seat with your hands on the wheel and that experience of driving the car. And so, High performance for a house can be very, very similar. It's the experience that the homeowner has living in their house. And as builders sitting in that sales seat, we need to find ways to explain that in, in simple terms. Uh, so high performance, what is high performance? High performance, first and foremost to me, you know, that the, the house has is, is, is gotta be affordable, right? There's no performance if the, the client can't afford to buy it. Second, I think for me is, you know, thermal comfort uh, which is a house that's evenly warm in the winter and it's evenly cool in the summer. I grew up in Toronto in a brick house that was built around 1915. As a, a, a young teenager, I would do homework in my room on the third floor in my down jacket. I could see my breath. Um, we had a house with uh, uh, water radiators, um, no insulation in the walls, no insulation in the roof a single thermostat in the main living room. My father would, uh, one the thermostat never went above 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and he would come home from work at around 6.30 or seven o'clock and he would build a great roaring fire in the living room. And of course the thermostat would be satisfied and the heat would never come on for the rest of the night. So it was really, really cold. Uh, and that to me, you know, as a teenager, that was just the way houses were. And then of course in the summertime in Toronto for anybody who grew up in Toronto, 90% uh, relative humidity uh, and 35 degrees by the early part of June. Uh, my bedroom on the third floor was a sweat box. Uh, I don't think I, as a teenager, ever slept from the end of May um, until school went back in in September. It was so hot and so uncomfortable. And so for me, you know, one of the, you know, what is, what really excites me about, you know, the houses that we deliver is we're delivering a house uh, that is thermally comfortable. Um, and then indoor air quality. Uh, when I grew up, there was the, the ventilation was the natural ventilation that whistled through the gaps in the framing and the gaps in the windows. Uh, so cold, drafty, and yeah, well, well ventilated. Um, but you know, as we build houses tighter and tighter, then of course we need um, a very, very effective system that delivers fresh air to all the rooms that we live in and exhausts all that stale air from the areas that create moisture and smells, kitchens and bathrooms and and that 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 stuff. And so. That, that, that's what high performance to me. And then high performance is a house that's durable. Uh, you know, if we look back to the, the 1970s when, you know, your new car would have rust spots on it in three or four years, 
Um, to me, that was not a performance car. Uh, they rusted out, they were rust buckets and, you know, within, everybody bought a new car every four to five years because the cars were done. And so as we move forward with, you know, particularly the cost of housing, we need to be really focused on housing that, you know, is low maintenance uh, and is going to be durable for the long term. You know, a family is not going to be spending more and more money every year trying to repaint or fix or repair their house. And so that, that durability is not only in the, the, the structure of the house that we build, it doesn't have moisture problems. Uh, the durability is built into the heating system. You know, this is not a complicated system. Uh, with a bare minimum of maintenance in terms of replacing filters and having it checked once a year. You know, the homeowner is confident that that system is going to perform for them for the next 10 or 15 years or 20 years. We shouldn't be putting things into our houses that need constant upgrading and, and replacement. What's the future of home building? You know, I think we're going to see a lot more prefabrication, automation of how we build. How that eventually lands, I, I'm not entirely too sure, but I do know that wood frame construction uh, is uh, low carbon, uh, it's simple, it's cost effective. You know, I really strongly believe we're going to continue to build wood framed houses uh, and we're going to evolve to a place where the structure of your house is prefabricated in an assembly indoors um, with some form of automation. You know, right now, the industry is, I think, really looking at all kinds of different ways from big warehouses with very, very expensive German automation equipment uh, where there's very little hands-on work uh, to produce that. If anybody's interested, you know, look at Landmark Homes out of Edmonton and see, you know, what, you know, they've, they've got a, you know, a fantastic facility there where there's an enormous amount of machinery in, in, in there that creates automation, you know, huge investment. We, we have our own uh, panel plant that we're actually just um, enlarging right now. Um, we've been panelizing uh, all our projects uh, all the way back to about 2010. Uh, we were using panels from others um, over the last four years. We've been developing our own system for panelization. It's pretty much the same two by six wall that everybody else is using. Uh, we're looking to expand that facility and we're looking at a simple automation process that's made in Canada um, to help reduce the labor uh, to produce those walls out of the factory. And so, you know, that's, that's certainly one, one, one place that I see this. There's no doubt um, that, uh, you know, we're sitting in a place right now where a lot of people are afraid that they can't afford housing. Uh, and so the big challenge for our industry is how do we get better to deliver lower cost houses? Um, you know, one of the things that we've been putting a lot of focus on is lean, lean construction, I just sent uh, three guys down to the United States for the Lean Congress, uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do we optimize the resources that we have uh, to do things better and do them in less time. Uh, and in that way, you know, we can continue to deliver houses that are affordable for the clients that come to us looking for that home or that renovation. So, I, you know, that's what are the, you know, some of the key messages, you know, that integrated design process, you know, it's so important. Uh, to start to engage your entire team early on in the design process. It doesn't matter whether you're in the development side or you're in the custom home side. It doesn't matter whether you're building new houses or renovations. Using that integrated process absolutely will deliver a better house at a lower cost. Um, looking at you know, some form of prefabrication, you know, whether you're going to do it internally or whether you look to uh, other organizations that are setting up to do this and in our local area, you know, I think more and more there are companies that are setting themselves up to do prefa prefabricated, uh, panelized um, uh, wall, wall systems and roofs and floors. Uh, you know, one of the greatest advantages of panelization is it will shorten your time on site. So one of the things I strongly recommend everybody do is understand what is the cost per week to have my team on site and what is the savings if I can shave four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks on my framing because I had all these components delivered, prefabricated, that took me three or four or five days to assemble as opposed to that five or six weeks out there framing in the rain. Uh, I get asked every once in a while is, you know, what would you tell your 20 year old self um, if you could? So for anybody who is not in the home building industry today, uh, but is passionate to become a home builder, the first thing I would tell you is go and find the best builder in your area and go get a job.
go and work for somebody who really does this right. You know, figure out how they do it, what is their system, what are their strategies around HR, how do they engage their client, learn from somebody who's doing it right. I think, you know, I spent a ton of money trying to figure this out on my own. Um, if you're already in the industry, as I've said before, join your local home builders association and sit around the table with your peer group over dinner, over breakfast, uh, over a few beers, everybody will share their stories. They'll share what worked, what doesn't work, and what keeps them up at night. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've made some terrible mistakes. Uh, I have very gray hair. I had a client in 2003. Uh, we sort of stumbled onto a very high value project team. You know, my very small team, we were very excited uh, to be able to build a very, very fancy house. Um, we knew uh, that we could build a great house. We did not know how to handle the client. We didn't know how to deliver um, the, 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 the budget information on a regular basis. You know, we had a client and an architect that just ran away with the design. So every time I turned around, um, the cost was going up. You know, we started off with a budget, I think, of about uh, $1.2 million, and we spent nearly $3 million bucks. That was That was painful. Um, I did not make a lot of money on that job, um, and that uh, that kept me up for a long time because I just didn't know how to handle it. You know, if I'd had a chance to go and work for somebody in that space, uh, I would have learned a lot of lessons right out of the gate that could have set that client up for success, I think. You know, I tell my team uh, that we deserve the clients we get. Most clients are predisposed to being good clients if you manage them well from the very beginning, but it's not as easy as it seems. And as I said earlier, there's lots of books out there. And you know, you read a great book and you're like, wow, okay, I can do that. That seems easy. It is not that easy to put it into practice. Uh, so go work for somebody. Uh, if you can't, if you're already working, um, go join your local home builders and learn from all the old guys like me. We'll share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so you don't have to have those expensive uh, lessons that we learned. And you know, when you're my age, maybe your hair is still blonde.